fly girl, fly girl, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when your plane disappears? That's right. <laughs> this is the big one. Partial local sweetheart, born in Kansas, just like my last one, but this time not in Manhattan, Kansas. Where? Atchison. Atchison? <laughs> on July- I'm from Atchison. Uh, I'm also a female pilot, adored by everyone. <laughs> so she was born July 24th, 1897. Little Amelia Mary Earhart. Sweetheart. Second daughter of Amy and Edwin. She lived most of the time with her grandparents in Atchison, but she spent the summers with her parents in Kansas City because her dad was a railroad attorney, so her parents were moving around a lot. He wasn't blowing glasses. Blowing smoke up arses. <laughs> That's how he makes a living. <laughs> By going around blowing smoke up of a bunch of councilmen's arses. That's my Kansas accent. I don't I don't know who you're impersonating, but I like it and I hope that this doesn't drop anytime soon. Oh, it won't. Oh, it won't, Sonny. <laughs> it won't, Sonny. Back on the plains of Kansas. <laughs> So in 1908, she moved with her parents to Des Moines. Uh, oh, Des Moines. And it was here at age 12 at the Iowa State Fair uh-huh. that she saw her very first airplane. And she didn't care at all. <laughs> she was interested in a lot of things. That was not one of them. She played basketball. She took auto repair courses. She studied other cultures. She read the Quran. These were all things that girls at the time weren't she's, doing. She's they weren't, not the usual girl. Yeah, she wasn't. She's not that kind of girl. Yeah. That combined with having to move around so much made her something of an outcast among the other kids. In 1913, she moved again to St. Paul. And in 1915, she moved with her mom and her sister to Chicago after her mom left her dad for him taking part in his second career. That sounds kind of like being an attorney being an alcoholic <laughs> oh i'm an alcoholic now that's my Stop that's now. my colin farrell <laughs> so all of this moving around nobody yeah. you know can't make many friends her high school yearbook caption said ae amelia Earhart, the girl in brown who walks alone jesus christ yeah sad i'll show you i won't walk anymore <laughs> i don't need to walk i don't need to walk Where i'll I'm fly alone <laughs> After high school in 1916, she moved away to go to the Ogontz School near, I don't know, near Philadelphia. But during Christmas vacation in 1917, she went to Toronto to visit her, Toronto, Toronto. to visit her sister Muriel, who was a nurse helping wounded soldiers from World War the first one. And she was so interested by that, that she quit school and she moved to Toronto to learn first aid from the Red Cross. And she got a job at the Spadina Military Hospital where she served meals. She scrubbed floors. She played tennis with the patients as she worked in the pharmacy because she had some um, chemistry experience. Mm. A lot of the soldiers she was helping recover were aviators. Oh, cool. And on her off hours, she'd sometimes watch the nearby Royal Flying Corps train. She even went to an air show where a stunt pilot dive bombed her <laughs> to scare her. But instead of running away, she knew he was trying to scare her. So she yeah. just stood there Shh. just to stick it to the guy. And it was this close call with an airplane that also did nothing for her. And she didn't care about airplanes <laughs> at all. So when the war ended in 1918, she got hit hard by the Spanish flu and she was recovering for a year. There's That's all- the same Spanish flu that shut down production for the Lincoln Brothers movies. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the same Spanish flu that killed, killed like everybody. A- <laughs> yeah, that, that like Lincoln But more importantly, had. it couldn't make movies. She couldn't do anything. She learned how during her year off, she learned how to play the banjo and she studied poetry. <laughs> hey, hillbilly. And she learned how Poetic engines, hillbilly. She learned how engines worked in some weird precursor to becoming Steve Martin. So in 1919, when she she was finally recovered, she decided to continue her medical education and she enrolled at Columbia University in New York City, Kansas, to study pre-med. But she soon realized that becoming a doctor actually wasn't something she was interested in doing and she was looking for a way out. So lucky for her, in 1920, her parents got back together and we're living in the land of reconciliation, Los Angeles. Oh, that's where everyone gets back together. (laughs) We need a change. And they insisted that Amelia move out there and live with them. So she gladly dropped out of school again and they moved to North Hollywood to live with her parents. So it was here in LA that finally... Amelia got hit by the bug, not the one that creates J. Jonah Jameson. And it wasn't the sort of bug that gave her the Spanish flu for a year either. This was a bug that flew, but not flew. You know what I'm trying to say. (laughs) It was a flu bug that gave her the flu. So on December 28th, 1920, her dad took her to the Winter Air Show at the dedication of Earl Doherty's Oh, Doherty's, his new airfield. Oh my God, I regret (laughs) encouraging this. In Long Beach. It was west of Long Beach Boulevard and south of Willow Street. So here's something finally clicked in her mind and she finally got deeply interested in airplanes and she begged her dad. She saw these planes flying. She begged her dad, I want to go up in one of those things. So the next day he arranged for her to take a 10 minute flight for $10 with Frank Hawks at Rogers Field, which was at Wilshire and Fairfax, where Biggie would eventually be shot by an airplane like in North by Northwest. (laughs) He couldn't run fast enough. (laughs) He's so big. Yeah, he can't. He's not Cary Grant. Biggie, biggie, biggie. Can't you run? (laughs) 
he took her up over Wilshire, over the oil fields, over the dinosaurs still dying in the tar pits because this was so long ago. And as she remembered it, by the time I got two or 300 feet off the ground, I knew I had to fly. Wow. She got the flu. She got the flu and she flew. She got the bug. And then she was in the hospital the rest of her life and she's still alive. And with that, her great and horrible fate was sealed. The next step to getting herself flying was learning how to fly. So just a few days later on January 3rd, 1921, she went down to Kinnerfield at Long Beach Boulevard in Tweedy in what is now Southgate Southgate. and approached a woman named Anita Nita Snook. You just keep making up names and you can't find it, huh? (laughs) Anita Nita Snook Snooky. She was one of the (laughs) first- Anita Cookie. (laughs) She was tossing cookies. This time she was tossing Snookies. Which is her name. (laughs) So Nita was one of the first female pilots in the entire world. She was one of the first women to graduate from the Curtis School of Aviation. She was only a year older than Amelia, but she had already been flying for four years. So the lessons cost a dollar a minute, which was not the kind of money Amelia had. So to get things started, she gave Nita a bunch of Liberty Bonds and her training began. (laughs) Quick, I only have four dollars teach me everything you know you can cash this in 40 years <laughs> i won't be around so don't come crying to me snooky snooky so her training began their lessons happened in a curtis canuck oh a canuck and <sighs> and let it be said nita did not think amelia was a natural at all she was constantly having to dodge power lines their first crash happened when the engine stalled and then landed just before hitting a bunch of eucalyptus trees near the goodyear field oh wow okay they were fine and amelia immediately got out of the plane and started powdering her nose because she knew the news was going to cover the crash because anything that happened in an airplane back then was news and she said yeah. we've got to look good when the reporters arrive oh my God. so another time and then uh aggie came who are you where am i what <laughs> year is it <laughs> what year what year is it another time they crash landed in a cabbage patch yep. that also didn't desert her from flying but she said it just made her not want to eat cabbages anymore it's fair they landed in mud a few times and got stopped short and thrown out of the airplane oh my God. None of this stopped her, though. She wanted to learn everything about flying. She would regularly be at the North Hollywood Library reading anything she could about airplanes. The library that's there now is in a different location at the time, but she was living in that area later in her life also, so I think she was in the one that's there now also. So she wanted to live the lifestyle of a a flyer. So this is when she cut her hair short to look like the other women pilots, and she bought herself a leather jacket that she would sleep in to make it look worn out because people were making fun of her. pretty cool. She would take the lessons on the weekend, but during the week she had to work to pay for it. So she had a ton of different jobs. She was a stenographer. She was a filing clerk at the Los Angeles Telephone Company. She was at the Pacific Bell Company on Magnolia in North Hollywood. She was a truck driver. She worked in a gypsum mine with her dad near Las Vegas. She took a photography class at USC to become a professional photographer because she she was just doing flying for fun. She didn't yeah, think... it was her hobby. Yeah, exactly. And she, she was saying, oh, maybe I'll be a photographer and fly on the side. But she made enough money not only to pay for her lessons, but on her 25th birthday on July 24th, 19- 1922, she bought her very own airplane. A Kinner? No. Uh, yes. She, <laughs> uh, sorry, I hadn't read that far. My intern typed this up. Thank you, intern. Thank you. are welcome. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> she could have bought an old World War I surplus plane, but she wanted something special. She ended up paying four times as much to go down to the Grand Central Air Terminal yeah. in Glendale and bought herself a brand new Kinner Airster. It still stands to this day, that airport. It's, I mean, it's not an airport anymore. It's Disney, but whatever. <laughs> they make uh, imaginations fly. So she bought it for $2,000. It was bright yellow, so she nicknamed it the Canary, and That's she was cute. in love with it. She nicknames everything you'll find. Finally, after 25 hours of lessons, she was ready to take in a row. That was her first record. She The longest, longest plane lesson. Yeah. So she was ready to take her first solo flight. And as one pilot on the ground told her when she was done, you didn't do anything right but land rottenly. <laughs> Regardless, on December 15th, 1921, she got her license from the National Aeronautics Association. And just two days later, she flew in her first exhibition at the Pacific Coast Ladies Derby at the Sierra Airdrome in Pasadena. I have a question. Yeah. Was she a great pilot? No. Okay. Because now that you're talking and I've, I've known about her her almost my entire life i knew that she was a female pilot and she did things that people never done before but I, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're no, a she great wasn't pilot. really I'm, i'll get into it a little bit more but okay. she she was an average pilot okay she didn't win these derby like she wasn't winning yeah, these that's things. what that now that you said that i'm like oh you know i don't know if she yeah, was an awesome she was pilot. a she, she was, was a, a pilot she, she was a pilot who was yeah. a female and she did things that no one done before she was a trailblazing pilot yeah. chem trailblazing pilot if you believe roseanne which i do she and nita had become good friends and went on double dates together you know snooky yeah. but in august 19 19- 1922, Nita had a son and too many of her pilot friends had died in plane crashes and she knew her luck would eventually run out. So she wanted to be around her son. So she quit flying. So Amelia's lessons transferred over to a guy named Johnny Monty Montijo. That is a name. Who did stunts for Goldwyn Studio and gave lessons at a field across from Kinnerfield. But this was 
perfect for Amelia because she wanted to learn advanced flying techniques and emergency maneuvers. And Monty being a stunt pilot, that's what he was able to offer her. And pretty quickly, she started getting more daring. Just a couple months later, on October 22nd, 1922, she flew in an air meet at Rogers Field and became the first woman to fly solo above 14,000 feet, which was actually it was actually extremely dangerous yeah. because when she was up there, her engine stalled oh, and she had to go into a tailspin to get down and there was a ton of fog. So she pulled up right after the fog. But if the fog had been lower, she would have crashed into crashed the ground. Directly into the ground. <laughs> yeah. Great pilot. <laughs> then on May 16th, 1923, she got pilot license number 6017 from the Federation Aeronautique Internationale. She was just the 16th woman ever to do so. So now she was eligible to compete in international competitions. She joined the Long Beach Air Circus. Hey, that's cool. I would like to have that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we'll also be selling them. It'll say uh, Pan Pacific Association on the front, Long Beach Air Circus on the back. Party in the middle. <laughs> because uh, we couldn't fit it in. It's under the shirt. <laughs> You're wearing it. <laughs> it says it on the chest. tag. Yeah, it says it on the tag. You're the party. So in March 1923, she was in the Lady Sports Plane Special at the Air Rodeo at the Glendale Airport. But by May of 1924, her family was running out of money and she was forced to sell the canary that she loved oh, so much to support canary. them. Strangely, Amelia never had any serious accidents the entire time that mm -hmm. she'd been flying. But the guy who bought the canary on his first flight in it, he crashed it and died. Oh my God. Golly. Curse. <laughs> you win this time, Amelia. <laughs> so the airplane money wasn't enough anyway, and her parents divorced again, and Amelia moved cross-country with her mom to Boston, which had to have been pleasant, and thus ended her first stint in LA. She tried in 1925 to go back to Columbia, but she ran out of money again, so she got a job as a teacher and then moved back to Boston in 1927 to be a social worker at the Denison House, which was a woman-run settlement house for immigrants, and she taught English to people from Syria and China. But destiny couldn't keep her away from planes for very long. 1928, a pilot slash flight promoter named Hilton H. Rayleigh had a plane named Friendship, and he wanted to take a he wanted to make a splash. Not hopefully not take a splash. Yeah, that's he two different things. <laughs> he wanted to make a splash by finding the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, just like Charles Lindbergh did. Word got out that there was a woman who could fly living in Boston, and just her luck, she kind of looked like Charles Lindbergh too. So in April 1928, she does. She, yeah, I get, you're you're right. She They're does. both cute girls. So Lindbergh's a cute tall girl. <laughs> in April 1928, Rayleigh asked her if she was interested and she responded yes immediately, but it turned out to not be what she thought. She wasn't going to be flying the plane. She was just going to be the first female passenger on a transatlantic flight. That's not the same thing. No. In friendship were Wilmer Stoltz flying, Lou Gordon as the mechanic, and Amelia Earhart, as she put it, a sack of potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> they left from New... Watcher of the gas. Yeah. Make sure there's no one else coming. <laughs> Count um, the clouds. I don't know. <laughs> make sure the air's up. They left left from Newfin Newfoundland, Newfoundland on July 17th, 1928 and landed in Wales on July 18th. And Amelia, even though she didn't really do anything, became an instant celebrity. She wrote a book about her experience called 20 Hours, 40 Minutes, which is how long it took. 20 Hours, 40 to write Minutes the book. of Being a Potato Sack. <laughs> My Life as a Potato, potato Sack. sack. <laughs> and other musings. With this book, she toured around the country giving lectures about her experience and she became more and more famous. Managing her publicity tour was a writer named George Putnam who saw the wow. potential of a female pilot as a great story. He also saw the potential of a female pilot as a great wife. He fell in love with Amelia and Amelia had no interest at all. Are you a plane? I, I only love planes. I only love planes and also only that barely for most of the time. <laughs> also, George was already married to the heiress of the Crayola company. You can't erase a Crayola. <laughs> But in 1929, he divorced her to pursue Amelia, who wasn't interested in getting oh married to anybody at all. She said of the whole thing, I think I may not ever be able to see marriage except as a cage until I am unfit to work or fly or be active. And of course, I, I wouldn't be desirable then. I respect all of the things that she just said. She's cold hearted. Get married. <laughs> he divorced his wife. You better marry him. You Lindbergh looking lady. <laughs> he threw out all his Crayolas or something uh, or for so you. I only read half the article. <laughs> so least of all, she didn't want to marry her publicity guy who didn't oh, yeah. even like flying. Nevertheless, Jesus. nevertheless, he persisted in asking her to marry him five times. And every single time she said, no. I hate this guy. Then finally, he asked her again in the most romantic place on earth, the Lockheed plant in Burbank. And she finally said, okay, I guess. Fine. But she wrote to him saying, I want you to understand, I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. So I'm going to say definitively that they were swingers. She wouldn't take his name either for publicity reasons. She also said if in a year they were unhappy, they're getting a divorce. So with 
But those timeless vows, <laughs> they got... <laughs> hey, save it for our wedding day. So they got married in Connecticut on February 7th, 1931. They didn't have a ring, so they had to borrow his mom's romances. L uh, is for the way you look at planes. L is for the oh. way you look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. O is, oh no, I don't love you. <laughs> In 1934, the happy, I guess, couple moved back to Los Angeles into a bungalow in North Hollywood. But in 1935, George became the head of the editorial department at Paramount Studios. So they had a little more money and moved to 10042 Valley Spring Lane in Toluca Lake. The house is still there. They were some of the first people to buy property in Toluca Lake. They chose that area because the best planes in the world were being built by Lockheed and Burbank. And she wanted to be near the action, but also because they'd be near a friend of hers, Paul Mance, who was a Hollywood stunt pilot that gave her technical advice. And also it's a nice area. Yeah. She used to golf at the Lakeside Golf Club. But enough about her weird love life. Let's get back to her personal achievements, the things she actually loved. Yeah. In August 1929, she bought a brand new single engine red Lockheed Vega 5B that she nicknamed Old Bessie. Ace pilot she was, she placed third in the <laughs> first Santa Monica to Cleveland Women's Air Derby. Or hey, that's in the box. She placed. Will Rogers called this race the Powder Puff Derby. Ah. On July 5th, 1930, she set the women's flying speed record at 181.18 miles per hour. 1931, she set the auto gyro height record at 18,415 feet. Wow. Then in 1932, she decided to live up to the nickname people gave her of Lady Lindy and match Lindbergh's achievement from five years earlier of flying across the Atlantic solo, but this time as a woman and not racist. So on May 20th, 1930... Which is an achievement. We should not dismiss it as a joke. Also in the box. The first woman not to be racist, Amelia Earhart. (laughs) So on May 20th, 1932, the anniversary of Lindbergh's flight, she set out from Newfoundland... Newfoundland... Newfoundland. In her... In her... uh, My accent's better. (laughs) In her Vega, and she headed toward Paris. Texas. the Atlantic. (laughs) The first transatlantic flight from Canada to To Texas. Texas. The weather was so bad that at a certain point, ice started forming over her wings and she dropped 3,000 feet before she could correct herself towards the ocean. Also, she got lost along the way in some thick clouds. And when she finally found land, she ended up parked in a field of cows in North Ireland. North Ireland! It's not better than mine. It's about the same, though. (laughs) I wish that scare where she almost hit the ocean would have taught her a lesson. Hey, don't hit the ocean. (laughs) The ocean hits back. So she landed in North Ireland around a bunch of cows the next day. She wasn't in Paris, but she did cross the Atlantic solo and in record time also. It took her 14 hours, 56 minutes. The first woman to have ever done this and the second person ever to have done this alone. She was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for this, becoming the first woman ever to receive that. But 1932 wasn't over for her as she also became the first woman to fly solo across the U.S. from L.A. To Newark. Then in 1933, she did that same trip again in the national air races, but even faster. Still a bad pilot. On January 11th. I was just about to say, you know, it sounds like she's a good pilot. I don't know. She sounds like a fast pilot, which I appreciate. If there's one thing that's safe about flying, it's being fast. It's being really fast. So on January 11th, 1935, she flew alone for 17 hours and seven minutes from Honolulu to Oakland, making her the first person to fly from Hawaii to the American mainland, the first person to fly anywhere solo in the Pacific, and the first person to have ever flown solo across the, Pol- the Pacific and the Atlantic. Damn. All in one That's one great. trip. One tri- that was one trip? Yeah. Then later that year, she became the first person to fly solo from LA to Mexico City and then from Mexico City to Newark, which are kind of, you know, these records are kind of getting like, well, I flew from the middle of Texas. Yeah, I was the first person to ever fly from the bottom of Canada to the yeah. top of Mexico. <laughs> first person. Write it down. First person on a Tuesday, that is. The flying didn't go unnoticed. She was a huge celebrity during all this. She was on the cover of Vogue in 1932. She was in a place of honor at the 1932 LA Olympics sitting with Fay Ray and Douglas Fairbanks who is King Faye Kong Ray. of his own. She had an endorsement deal with Lucky Strike. Again, I've seen Mad Men. I know what that is. Um, it makes sense now. I get Dick Whitley. <laughs> I get Do Whitley smoking. <laughs> Do Whitman. In 1933, partly to try to recoup the money after her Atlantic flight, she started a clothing line. Did you know that? I didn't. I had no idea. She personally designed 25 outfits of dresses and shirts. The tag had her signature in black writing over the image of a red airplane. That's great. Some of the clothes were made out of things like parachute silk and and maybe the Aggie wanted some of that. She loves silk. And also airplane wing material. And the buttons were shaped like propellers. That's all of that sounds great. Yeah. They sold at Macy's and it did not last long, but it sounds really nice. I bet they're worth like millions. If of any of those now. still exist well, I mean, they're probably all missing everything of hers. She had a box of it. The last box. <laughs> she took it all with her took on her, her flight. All with her. I'm gonna be the first person to fly their own clothing <laughs> all around the world. To write an article about me. Do a podcast about me. What's that? In nineteen thirty four, the fashion designers of America named her one of the ten best dressed 
dressed women in America. She also had a line of luggage that was still selling into the 90s. She had a personal photographer named Albert Bresnik. She wrote a book called The Fun of It, but it wasn't all just about her. She actively encouraged people to give flying a try, either commercially or for fun. She was made aviation editor for Cosmopolitan wow. Magazine and was a promoter for what would become TWA. And she was also vice president of National Airways. More specifically, she promoted women's rights and encouraged women to try flying and not to accept the careers that society was forcing on them. In 1929, she founded and became the first president of the 99s, which is an international organization for women pilots, mm -hmm. named because out of the 285 licensed female pilots in the US, 99 of them joined when they were asked. In 1935, she even became a visiting professor in aeronautics and female career consultant at Purdue University. She used her celebrity to inspire women by proving in front of all of them that a woman could do anything a man could do and that flying was safe for everybody mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. <laughs> that being said it it wasn't always safe and Amelia Earhart wasn't an ace pilot. She had determination and she had an ability not to panic but her publicity stuff got in the way of her being able to train more and become better at flying but that combination of a need for publicity and not being fully trained in a lot of ways uh -huh. is what led to what would become her final flight. She was getting to a point in her life where she was becoming too old to do these insane Long. marathon yeah. things and she had decided to take Take one final trip doing something that nobody had ever done before, which was circumnavigating the entire world around the oh. equator, which is the longest route because yeah. Earth's chubby. Yeah. I believe in the chubby Earth theory. I'm a, chu I'm a chubby, chubby Earther. Earther. <laughs> who is the brother of Chubby Checker. She said, I have a feeling that there is just about one more good flight left in my system, and I hope this trip is it. Uh, what a miscalculation. I know. She, well, it's not wrong. She wanted to do this before she turned 40, so she set to work planning the trip with George under the carob tree in the courtyard of their house in Toluca Lake. That's where this was all planned, in Toluca Lake. When word got out of her plan, Purdue University bought her a brand new plane specifically designed for this trip. It was a twin engine Lockheed Electra L10E. We all know the model. <laughs> it's not the F. It's not like the F or the D. Yeah, it's the L. It's the E and the L. It was made in Burbank and it cost $80,000. It was 38 feet, seven inches long with a wingspan of 55 feet and was 10 feet, one inch tall. But with the modifications she had made on it, it weighed 6,000 pounds more than the regular ones mm -hmm. because this one had 10 gas tanks that could hold 1,151 gallons, which could take it a little over 4,000 miles without having to refuel. It could hold 80 gallons of oil and had a max speed of 177 miles per hour, which was 25 miles, 25 miles, uh, hours per minute. <laughs> it was a little bit less than other planes because there was, was so much stuff y in it. You said I can hold all that gas and immediately thought it's too heavy. <laughs> I it's know. way too heavy. It had a station for a navigator, no passenger windows. It had an autopilot system, extra batteries, radio equipment, and also equipment to test atmosphere samples and inspecting landing areas around the world. Yeah. This is why Amelia called it her final nickname, the Flying Laboratory, okay. which was my basketball nickname as well, because <laughs> I was really smart. She test flew it on July 21st, 1936 at what is now the Burbank Airport, formerly the Union Air Terminal. I don't even know if uh, that's what it's called anymore. The Burbank, it's like Bob I Hope. John Wayne, yeah. I don't know. North Hollywood, but North not by, North Hollywood, North Burbank. <laughs> I've heard it called Bob Hope before, but I don't know if it's It like used I'm... to be Bob Hope. Okay. We Bob all used no to hope. be Bob Hope. Yeah. Bob. Bob Hopeless. A new Bob Hope. A new Hope Airport. Keep going. No. <laughs> no! <laughs> so she tried it out. It was up to her standards. And then a few more months of planning, she departed from Burbank Airport. There's a video of her leaving on this flight. <laughs> Left for her trip's official starting destination of Oakland. The plan was to head west from there to Hawaii and then beyond. With her was her friend Paul Mance, as technical advisor, her navigator Fred Noonan, and another guy named Harry Manning. And on March 17th, 1937, they departed Oakland for Hawaii. Four of them did? Uh, you'll, you'll see. Okay. Immediately, they started having trouble with the plane, and they had to stop at Luke Field in Pearl Harbor. They had a bunch of Japanese planes following them. <laughs> then while they were there, the weather conditions changed, and that made the route they planned seem less possible. Then they tried to take off again on March 20th. They crashed before they could leave the airfield, and that was the end of the trip. Okay. That's it. The plane had to be sent back to Burbank for repairs, and then Mance and Manning dropped out, and they should have stopped there, but yeah. Amelia and Noonan were not deterred, and they just went back to LA to wait until the plane was fixed, uh -huh. and when it was ready, they decided to continue the trip, just the two of them, only this time they'd head east instead of west, so they flew out again from Burbank and then to Miami, and on June 1st, they were off for real. They followed the equator, stopping in Puerto Rico, Suriname, Brazil, Senegal, Chad, Sudan, Ethiopia, India, Burma, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, and Australia. 
And then on June 29th, they around in Lay, Papua New Guinea, where Amelia had the second worst thing possible to happen to her on a trip like this, and she got struck with dysentery. So they. St- <laughs> what is this, the Oregon Trail? <laughs> Just ford the rest of the way. It's safer. So they stayed for a few days, but on July 2nd, it was time to move on to the next stop of their journey, which was the tiny Howland Island, 2,556 miles away. So to make the trip easier, they left behind some of their long range radio equipment and to make room for more fuel, which in hindsight was not the best idea. And they left at 12.30 p.m. There was a U.S. Coast Guard ship called the Itasca who was stationed nearby the Howland Island in case anything happened. And they were in regular contact with them. But the conditions were worse than they anticipated. And there was some miscommunication with the ship because the distance they were flying during this leg of the trip is almost as long as the entire United States. So the plane and the boat were operating in different time zones. So there was confusion on what time they were expected to be there. So towards the end of the flight, they radioed the boat saying that they were low on fuel, but they were within 100 miles of the island. But because of the miscommunication, they couldn't locate the ship. And the island itself is it's a tiny island that's like really close to sea level. So if there's like a big wave, you can't really see it. And because they left behind most of their radio equipment, they couldn't broadcast out far enough to reach anybody. So then at 7.42 a.m., the ship received a radio transmission from Amelia saying, we must be on you, but we cannot see you. Fuel is running low. Been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at a thousand feet. Then at 8.45 a.m., they received a weak signal of her saying, we are running north and south. And that was the last anybody's ever heard of Amelia Airport. 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 Amelia uh, Airport. Yeah. The Atasca couldn't find them. FDR launched a $4 million search with 66 planes and nine ships looking desperately to find her. Nothing was found. On July 18th, 1937, the search was called off and she was assumed lost at sea. She only had another 7,000 miles to go until oh. her trip was over and she was just three weeks away from her 40th birthday. George didn't give up though and he continued the search with his own money. He yeah. tried everything, naval experts, he tried psychics, but in October, even he had to give up. A couple years later on January 5th, 1939, the Superior Court of Los Angeles declared her legally dead. And then there's the conspiracy theories. Let's hear it. One possible explanation is that they crashed on the Niku Maroro or Gardner Island because later on Navy planes flew over it and they saw signs of recent habitation and they found a piece of plexiglass that could have fit the shape of her plane's window and supposedly they also found a woman's shoe and a human finger bone but there was no sign of any wreckage or the rest of the bones. Yeah. Why would they leave just a finger? Yeah, unless it's a symbol. A <laughs> this, message. Is, this is their calling card. Yeah. We leave fingers all over the Pacific. <laughs> In May 2012, on another island nearby, they found an old jar of freckle cream with could have been hers. Yeah. Then there are the people who say they were spies for the U.S. government heading towards the Marshall Islands. And from there, the theories diverge in a few directions. There's the possibility that they were captured and executed by the Japanese, or they completed their mission and came back to the U.S. with new identities, or they turned on the U.S. and helped the Japanese plan the bombing of Pearl Harbor. She had been there before. Yeah. Then there was the picture that came out a couple of years ago that was supposedly from the Office of Naval Intelligence. That was a picture from the Marshall Islands with two people in it that looked a lot like Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan mm-hmm. and an electric airplane in the background. The capture theory also gets fuel from a telegram that George Putnam supposedly got after World War II was over from the Pentagon about an internment camp in Japan that got liberated. And it was an anonymous message addressed to George saying, Camp liberated, all well, volumes to tell, love to mother. Weird. Yeah. Or there's the theory that we just don't know and we'll probably never know. Sonar scans and deep sea robots have searched the replicants. They searched the area and there was no trace of anything, but obviously her memory is still alive and well. Throughout her last trip, she had been sending letters and diary entries home to George, which he put together and published after she died as Last Flight. And in 1939, he wrote her biography, Soaring Wings. The Vega B she flew across the Atlantic in, is in the Smithsonian, which when I, I, I saw it and I was thinking like, wow, that's Amelia Earhart's plane. Wait a minute. They didn't. They found it. <laughs> Is she in it? I have too? a lot of questions. <laughs> so more locally, there's a plaque to her at the portal of the folded wing shrine to aviation in Burbank. And in 1970, a teacher at Valley College made a statue of her that they put in front of the North Hollywood Library. The one that's there now was put there in 2002. But the fact that there's still so many theories about her lets you know how important yeah. and interesting she was. But it's important not to forget that she was a woman trying to prove a point mm-hmm. that she put best in a letter she left for George right before her last trip that said, please know. I am quite aware of the hazards. I want to do it because I want to do it. Women must try to do things as men have tried. When they fail, their failure must be but a challenge to others. 